And good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all well. I'm just going to start off today's session by doing a quick sound check. So if you can hear me, please type yes into your chat box. Just lets me know we're live and you can hear us. I hope you're all well. I'm not doing too bad in this heat. Let's see, have we got... Can everybody hear us? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much for the people that have typed into there. Thank you, great. Okay, so a quick introduction from me. My name is Chantelle Newton and I'm the Marketing Manager at the UK Contact Centre Forum and the editor of our online e-magazine Contact Centre Monthly. I've just got a few housekeeping points to go through before we begin. We do have some polls for you to participate in today. So when prompted, the polls will appear automatically on your screen. Voting will remain open for about 30 seconds. And when the poll closes, the results will be shown on screen. Uh, after the presentation today, we'll be holding a few, a full Q&A session. Please post any questions that you may have our, for our presenters in the chat box that you've just used to do our sound check. So the webinar is expected to last about an hour today, but if you're unable to stay for the whole session, the webinar is being recorded and the link will be emailed to all participants within 24 hours of the webinar ending. So I'm going to get today's uh, session started and I'm going to hand you over to the very lovely Jackie. And uh, thank you, Jackie. Thanks very much, Chantel. Um, I'm Jackie Workman. Um, I'm the owner and uh, managing director of KMB Telemarketing based here in what is sunny Worcestershire today. And I'm sure it's sunny where you all are. So hopefully you're all um, got plenty to drink and plenty uh, of cold water there to keep you going. So I'm the uh, owner and managing director of KMB Telemarketing. We're an inbound, outbound, uh, mainly B2B telemarketing company been in existence now for 30 years. Uh, I've been the managing director for 12. And um, not only my role in as KMB, but I'm also working very closely, have been for over 10 years now with Elaine regarding vulnerable training and working with people in vulnerable circumstances over those years. So I'm gonna hand over to Elaine now to introduce herself. Joining us today, we also have Matt from Mind, Matt Radford. He's going to do a case study a little bit later on, so you'll hear from Matt later. Thanks, Jackie. So my name is Elaine Lee, and I'm uh, owner and managing director of a consultancy called Reynolds Busby Lee. We specialize in customer experience um, and understanding what the customer experience that your customers are actually feeling, hearing and uh, receiving. Uh, and within that, there is the inclusion of customers who find themselves in vulnerable circumstances during the, process, the moment that they're interacting with you. We look at uh, um, customer experience for a number of organisations in both the commercial and charitable sectors. Um, and actually the principles of what we do carry across all organisations. As Jackie said, we've been joined by Matt, who um, works with us on the DMA's Vulnerable Working Group, and we've known Matt for a number of years. Matt actually came on some of the training sessions that Jackie and I ran uh, back at the DMA, and subsequently his colleague Louise has been on those sessions too. So we'll let Matt tell you about his experience and what he learned from that and how he's applied it. Um, but first of all, really great to see so many of you registered for today's webinar. It's clear that vulnerability is a high profile topic with the regulators, the FCA, Ofcom, ICO, Ofgem, fundraising regulator, plus others, including the Ombudsman Service, really taking a firmer stance on ensuring that customers with in vulnerable circumstances are treated fairly. And that seems to be the mantra across any of the uh, regulators that we talk to. Um, and in order to be able to assess and demonstrate that your organisation is treating vulnerable customers as fairly as uh, and at the same standard as non-vulnerable customers, the first thing we've got to be able to do is identify them um, and to understand their needs. So we thought we'd start with a quick poll, get you interacting and up and running to start with. Yeah, so our quick poll um, is... Um, how often do you think your organization recognizes your vulnerable customers throughout their customer life cycle with you? If you'd like to answer your questions based on the answers there, that would be great.
Going to close the poll for you, Jackie. And Thank you. Here are your results. Okay, interesting. So we've got 4% that always recognise, 43% um, between 75 and 99%, 26% um, between 50 and 74, 17% between 25 and 49, and less than 25, 9%. So it's interesting that there is actually a good group of people that are certainly recognising their vulnerable customers um, within their life cycle of their business. Yeah, it looks as though about half of you think you're doing it consistently well and the other half aren't quite so sure. Um, so it's always interesting and I think part, part of the challenge is the scale of vulnerability within the UK and the SEA stating in their February report this year that 27.7 million adults could be considered to be vulnerable in a vulnerable circumstance at any one time. I think that almost is helpful in that we're not looking for needles in haystacks here. We are looking for frequent contact from customers in vulnerable circumstances. And the last 18 months, if nothing else, has probably increased that a little. Um, and for some organisations, it's not always easy to spot the signs of vulnerability um, because vulnerability can be permanent, but it may also be transient. It's not a label that all customers will um, self-apply to themselves so we can't rely on customers self uh, self declarations and it it's an interesting one with um covid and the government's definition of clinically vulnerable coming into play last year so it is a term that customers are throwing at us a bit more in our working lives now you know i'm clinically vulnerable so that's been an, an interesting change over the last few months um, but vulnerability does go beyond um, financial vulnerability and the FCA, I think, of, of all the regulators have probably led the way here in terms of their definitions and their, um, their guidance. Um, but vulnerability can be triggered by a whole raft of different life events or numbers of factors. And I know that the FCA works for four key triggers in terms of life events, ill health diagnosis, capability and equality. Jackie and I, sorry, in capability, Jackie and I have a fifth one that we typically talk around, around equality, because there are um, some members of our population who are disproportionately affected by, um, by vulnerable circumstances. Uh, so there's lots of statistics around the BAME community being uh, experiencing lower employment rates, which gives them more financial issues, but they're also at risk of higher health issues so and those things often come together it's very rare that you find a vulnerable customer who only has one thing happening in their life at, at any one moment yeah and i think i think that's exactly right Elaine. what we're what we're looking at is that many of the life events so simple single things that we might think are simple the birth marriages deaths but also you could be experiencing bereavement but also have a mental health issue so what we're you know what we're looking at is um transient and permanent um, vulnerabilities within um, uh, within people, but actually they still need to trade with organisations, they still need to buy goods, they still need to buy services. And it's how we um, look at how we can help those people and how we can um, move forward and make reasonable adjustments for them. So while some organisations might think about a fines from the regulator being a, a factor or an incentive for, what we really think, and in our experience, this is true, we think there are other, much other reasons, much better reasons, if I'm honest, um, to be more focused on building your customer relationships and your brand loyalty for all of those customers. So if the percentage, as the FCA said, then we as um, organisations who deal with customers every single day of the week are dealing with people in vulnerable circumstances. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the SEA's definition is around sort of 53% mark of the UK adult population. So it's not an uh, isolated instance. And of course, we can't exclude and we shouldn't be excluding those customers. And what we do need to do is support them with reasonable adjustments to make their customer experience as fair as anybody else is, but also uh, easy to travel the journey and not put hurdles in their way so that we are inclusive in our in our activity, which is why that in, we've added that um, the equality issue there around equality uh, and inclusion. Absolutely. Um, over the years, yeah, Jackie, you and I have worked with a whole raft of organisations from a range of sectors, from banking and insurance, through funeral planning, health lines, customer service, fundraising lines, 
Um, and typically we find organisations have tackling the same kind of problems around the quality of service that's being offered to customers in vulnerable circumstances. Um, and it's not for the want of, of deliberately or maliciously getting it wrong, it's just that they fail to recognise some of those customers in vulnerable circumstances until it's too late and then they're into remedial action. So in the work that we've done over the last few years, or the last 10 years, probably it's 10 years really, um, <laughs> is around trying to identify if there's some indicators that are fairly common. Um, and it's, the things that we often find when we go into work with an organisation is that there's usually a high levels of complaints around lack of understanding about products or services, claims of being missold, things that are inappropriate for those customers. We often encounter contact centre teams who are unhappy or frustrated, and despite them passing on complaints and raising continuous issues, nothing seems to change is a common mantra that we hear from contact centre teams. Or the vulnerable customers are being recognised too late, mm -hmm. usually after something's gone wrong, or they're not recognised at all until they get a complaint or an investigation through from perhaps a regulator. Net promoter scores, customer satisfaction scores are low or reviews on Trustpilot or FIFO are often in decline. Um, there can be an increase of cost without real clear explanation or understanding of why they're going up and that's often driven by repeat conversations with the same customer who hasn't understood something or has been um, sold something or serviced in a way that they weren't expecting. Um, and the customers are now beginning to ask for additional support that's perhaps outside of our normal business as usual processes. They're asking for and becoming a little bit more demanding in what their, their requirements are. Um, but also the other factor that we often see is that repeat business from those customers that we have on our customer base mm. is in decline. And more of our marketing spend is being spent on acquiring new customers to keep topping up that, that leaky bucket. Yeah, and I think, I mean, all of those are absolutely, absolutely relevant. We've come across those so many times, haven't we, when we've been uh, meeting with organisations and doing our work um, um, regarding vulnerable consumers and customers. And I think also that has increased significantly during the last 18 months of, of, mm -hmm. of the COVID pandemic. So um, I think, you know, we, we really do need to um, almost take a step back uh, and then for us, what we try and do with organisations and what we would advise you to do is, is start to try and unearth the root causes of the problems. Um, so we had, uh, we worked with, um, um, or met uh, an organization some, some time ago, who um, we're gonna run as a little bit of a case study for you now, just to give you some example, an example of what we're talking about. So this insurance company that we engage with um, had recruited a, a brand new marketing director um, into the business, and he wanted to turn the fortunes of the business around. It became really clear that at the heart of this was that customers, particularly in vulnerable circumstances, were not being recognised. Um, the, there were very little reasonable adjustments that could be made and they weren't really being offered uh, any support uh, through the buying process. Um, certainly some of the staff were uh, frustrated. Um, there was a high turnover of staff in this organisation. Uh, which was pushing up recruitment uh, and obviously training costs and impacting on customer service levels. So he needed to get to work quite quickly um, as to what he needed to do. Um, and this is um, the case study that Elaine will take us through a little bit more now. Yeah, and it's interesting because actually he'd been recruited on the basis that there was high levels of complaints and customers were buying policies that weren't really appropriate for them. So what could they do to make that better? And it was through that investigative piece that we examined why customers were finding it so difficult and um, to, to find the right purchase or um, policy for them or to even be sure that they were able and, um, and eligible to purchase those policies and they weren't exempt from making a claim. Um, and it was really quick that we established that the marketing materials, including the website, were just too difficult to understand. Policies themselves were littered with jargon, legalese terminology, and that the average customer just couldn't understand what they were being offered. They knew they had a need, and they thought from what they could understand of the marketing materials that were in the marketplace that 
that it, that it could be okay for them, it could be a relevant policy for them. And actually that's something that we found not just with this organisation, but with lots of others, where they've got terms and conditions or phrases that they are required to quote verbatim in calls, or on um, web pages or in policy documents in order to meet a legal and regulatory requirements. So they're not, they weren't alone in that challenge, um, but it is something that comes up an awful lot. And actually we focus on what we need as a business rather than what the customer needs from the interaction. And that can sometimes create problems and actually create vulnerabilities for some customers because they just can't follow what we're trying to tell them. No, absolutely. And it's, it is a common theme. And I think what we what we are trying to highlight here is that um, many of these issues may be things that you're experiencing in your organisation as well. Um, but it's also relevant in the world that we live in, um, because I'm not sure if any of you know this, but one of the statistics that we use quite regularly is the average reading age in the UK is between nine and 11 and the average numeracy age in the UK is 11. So that means that those, those individuals who are looking for products, and in this case, it's an insurance product, so it's something that they want to purchase. If they have that reading age or numeracy age, they're finding that extremely difficult to understand these documents, these T's and C's, these policies, et cetera. And if you base that in mind, that's right across the UK, those are individuals that are looking at your organizations are engaging with your organizations. But if you've all got also got the backdrop that they have a vulnerability as well, that just makes the problem even harder for them to get the products and services that really desperately need. Yeah, and if we think about those age groups, they're kind of equivalent to kids leaving primary school. They're not secondary school children. And actually our, our literacy and numeracy skills decline as we get older. Um, and that's something that we just need to bear in mind that we need to make our offering and our marketing materials accessible to all customers, whatever level of understanding that they have, and be able to offer additional support and, and understanding um, to those who are finding it perhaps a little complex. Yeah, and it's quite a frightening stat when you think about it. I mean, we didn't know that statistic, did we, Elaine, until we really started to do our research and understand mm -hmm. vulnerability a lot more. And I was quite shocked by that, if I'm honest. Yeah. So having for that organisation found that lack of understanding was at the heart of their problems, we obviously set about fixing things. And it, we worked with the staff to train them to recognise customers in vulnerable circumstances. There were certain keywords that their customers were regularly using. There were certain frequently asked questions that kept coming back and there were repeat conversations coming through and repeat calls coming through. So we worked with the staff to actually um, to recognise those signs of a potential vulnerability and be ready um, to, um, to anticipate and, and support that customer through perhaps in, in, in an enhanced service. And we often talk about being ready to meet somebody and expecting to meet a customer in a vulnerable circumstance. This is a really helpful mindset rather than walking in and being surprised when you do. If you go in expecting to meet somebody in a vulnerable circumstance, you're ready, you're prepared mentally, because actually this is a two-way conversation. We mustn't forget the staff within this. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, so we worked about the recognition, we worked with them on recognition, but we also looked at reasonable adjustments that could be made. Um, website and marketing materials were simplified. And for that organisation, they had they they didn't get rid of their needs or their requirement for regular for the having um, terms and conditions spelled out in set terms. But what they did do was have that down one side of the page, and on the other side of the page, they had what does that mean in plain English? So they understood their customer base and translated that into language that all of their customers could follow. Um, policy documents were revised to show both the legally required. Uh, information as well as plain English so it wasn't just their marketing materials they carried it through in all of their communications and staff were trained to use simple sums to explain complex sim, um, simple examples to explain complex sums for example APR you ask many contact centre staff about how do you how do you work how does uh, APR work and they'll struggle and if they're struggling to tell you as a business and it's a business that they work in then they sure us sure as anything are going to struggle to explain it to customers whose literacy or numeracy levels are perhaps a little bit lower than those within the team. Um, but processes were also amended to support accessibility needs, so those with visual impairments who needed 
their letters to be printed on yellow paper or in blue uh, ink rather than black. They made changes so that um, those with macular degeneration is, is the condition that springs to mind that gives that as a requirement. But um, what they did was they didn't just do it as a one-off, they set it up within their system so that every time they wrote to their, that customer who had that need, those, that paperwork was sent out in the right colours, the right fonts. Um, if they needed to remove images, they were able to do that and be able to do that on a consistent basis so that their customer service improved significantly. And as a result, they saw a massive improvement in their business case with complaints down, staff morale up um, and reduced costs because actually they were servicing an inquiry once rather than 10 times. Yeah, and I think that's the key driver here, isn't it? It's, it's about making those um, changes in your organisation that allow your staff to make those reasonable adjustments with confidence that then will allow the person to purchase goods and services that are right for them and that delivers then a fair outcome for all. So as you say, the results were um, um, great in this particular case study we're looking at. It was absolutely fantastic because it reduced the complaints, it improved staff morale no end uh, because they'd had the training, but therefore they felt comfortable and confident when they were dealing with customers. Um, it uh, made retention excellent, reduced the costs from where they were with recruitment, etc., cetera, um, and reduced marketing spend as well. And reviews and recommendations went through the roof. And actually, fact, they became so busy, I think they had to continue to recruit people for the demand that they had, which is a great story to have. But mm. it's not only true of just the insurance uh, sector, which is the one we've given as an example today. Think about your organisation, all of us, it's certainly my organisation, there's T's and C's that we have. Are they, you know, are they readable? Can we understand them? Are they plain English? Subscription terms, you might be a company that provides a subscription. Are they easy to understand? Are they easy to recognise? Are they easy to cancel, etc.? Energy tariffs. Um, I'm a guilty, I think energy tariffs sometimes absolutely, you know, just I, have no, I do not understand some of them, but can we make it easier for people? Complicated sign up forms that you might have in your organisation for registering or signing up for something. Are they really that simple? And maybe it's testing a little bit more and thinking about how you can get them to be um, available for people in uh, vulnerable circumstances. So how do you road test that? You know, do you ask a nine year old to read those documents? That might be an answer for you, might be a way forward. And also in particular websites that are very inaccessible. I think we can use examples of ones that we've come across in the past as well. Yeah, and actually that's a key part of the work that I do in my day to day life is, is helping organisations look from the outside in at their own organisation because it's really difficult to disconnect yourself from what you know from internal knowledge within an organization and what you know oh, well the website doesn't quite do that but we're working on it well your customer doesn't have that inside knowledge and therefore we've got to support those people who are trying to transact or interact now um, and that's the key piece of what we do is uh, it, rbl is around those customer experience and customer journey so that organizations get to the crux of what the problem is not what they think the problem is but where are the hot spots and the problems for, e for each of the customers and tesco's went through an example not with me sadly but they, they spent their marketing spend elsewhere but now back in 2000 they set up a a project around looking at their website and having an accessible website so you know this is 20 odd years ago now um, and actually what they found was that many full-sighted customers found the accessibility site much easier to use than their core site they took some of the distractions off and they invested around thirty-five thousand pounds in the site but they've got massive payback within the first year they that the accessible site took 30 million pounds worth of sales in year one so the payback was immediate um, and actually what it did do was allow them to, to look at their core site and say, do you know what, we can strip some of this back and make it much easier for all customers to use. So that yeah. was about them being able to track those, those customers with greater accessibility needs and those without. Um, and technology is a great solution, but in our experience, it's, it plays a supporting role um, if you're in a contact centre world. It doesn't replace an agent, but it gives them additional information. Um, and vulnerability is a fairly nuanced subject. 
um, the benefits from emotional intelligence in your team. And that's where, you know, we always talk about upskilling your team, and giving them the skills to be able to pick out those little cues that perhaps come up in a conversation, perhaps a keyword that might be used or a turn of phrase that might be used. If you're on live chat and somebody answers a question that you've not asked them and they keep asking you the same question, whatever you ask them, there are signs in the communications that come from our customers. And if we can recognize them, you can instantly start to improve that service that you're delivering. Um, and you can be then thinking about, right, what's the, what does that customer need from me? And what's the most sensible, reasonable adjustment that we can offer? What's the most appropriate solution for this customer at this moment? Because what we have to remember is that customers who are in a vulnerable circumstance today might not be tomorrow, mm -hmm. six weeks time, six months time. If it's a transient piece, perhaps they've been through a bereavement, what they need today may not be what they need going forward. So they might just want a little bit of extra time now, but in six months time, they, they may well have moved on, not for everybody, but some people may have moved on and be back into kind of core business as usual processes. Um, and therefore it's really important to help train your team and support them on how to recognize those signs of vulnerability and respond and be able to maintain their own resilience and um, to meet customer expectations on a regular basis. And I think the last 12, 18 months has put those frontline contact center teams under huge amounts of pressure because they've been working from home in unfamiliar environments. Some of them want to go back to work now. Some of them don't want to go back to work now. Some of them want to work in hybrid situations. And, you know, we all knew how the world was pre-COVID and actually it's changed quite significantly for both staff and for customers. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, it's, it's really important that we, we recognize the needs of our employees and staff as well. And vulnerability training is really important to help them get comfortable and familiar with what they're going to expect to meet on a conversation and who they're going to be talking to. It shouldn't be considered to be a one-off exercise. And where Jackie and I have worked with organizations, we've seen the best results in organizations that consider vulnerability throughout every aspect of the organization, from recruitment and induction of contact center staff. So making it clear in the adverts that when you're hiring staff that they'll be dealing with customers in vulnerable circumstance, that their induction process covers that and any anxieties they may have about handling those conversations mm -hmm. because it will include events that they're perhaps not experienced in their own lives yet. Um, and then ongoing training, coaching, development to support because our customer needs are changing all the time, our technology solutions are changing all the time and therefore we've got to keep upskilling our staff and making sure that they're keeping pace with all those changes that are going on. Um, and, it, and, and also about empowering staff to handle cases sensitively and with empathy. And we've seen huge increases in staff morale and retention, which have cut recruit, you know, um, mm. recruitment costs because their staff are much happier and understand what's been expected of them. They're then meeting the, um, the requirements in their terms of their performance reviews. They understand where they're perhaps not quite getting it right, but they're able to access support and help when they need it. And it's not made into a taboo subject where it's right and wrong. It's about giving coaching and support to encourage them um, to be able to do that properly. Yeah, and, I, and that's absolutely key, isn't it? Um, thinking about customers in vulnerable circumstances but actually uh, your own teams and what they may well be uh, mm -hmm. experiencing as well because there are vulnerabilities within your own teams that need to uh, be taken into consideration um, and how they manage their workflow and as you rightly said so many people working at home that's become more of an impactful situation than it was probably previously as well. Yeah, and what we saw with the, the insurance company and the Tesco website example is that um, customer satisfaction levels improved because there was repeat traffic, repeat business coming through. Um, customer um, customers were so happy with the improved quality of service that they were actually becoming brand advocates um, and their loyalty to those brands were massively improved, which all drives money to the bottom line and the, and the revenue, um, which is another reason for us to be investing in this and getting it right rather than just being worried about regulator fines. Yeah, absolutely. OK, so we're at that point now where we've um, we've got a very quick poll for you, which Chantel will put up onto the screen now. Really quick one this. So has your organisation trained staff on vulnerability? 
really simple three possible answers there if you'd like to uh, particip participate that would be great just give everybody a couple of seconds to do that yeah great thank you Just going to close that off for you, Jackie. Gone quite stable. Thanks very much, Chantel. And here's your results. Okay. So, um, not at all 23%, um, 32% for customers facing staff, customer facing staff only, and all staff within your organization 45%. So, nearly half are going for um, all staff in organizations. I'm pretty impressed by that, are you? Yeah, I am actually. Yeah, that's great news. It really is great news because some people tend to sometimes only focus on customer facing staff. They do indeed. And I know that some of the where we've worked with organisations, when they talk about all staff, they include the, the cleaners and the security guards because you never know when somebody might encounter somebody within, a, perhaps not so much these days, but customers in buildings. Um, or somebody coming into the front desk or trying to get in to see somebody because they need help, uh, head office, HQ, um, but not just those or those staff who are um, talking to customers on a regular basis. And um, for us, we think that makes a huge difference if you can, um, if everybody knows around and understands the customers who support them and the business Absolutely. Yeah. And certainly from you know the 23% that haven't yet, um, there's lots and lots of information out there, lots of ways that you can get support and help. So you know, I think it's a message that we're really we kind of bang the drum uh, quite a lot about this. You can probably understand we're very passionate about it. We're doing it for a very very long time, um, and we want organisations to be successful and treat people fairly. So that's what we're what we're really looking for here. But this approach just doesn't work. Sorry, doesn't just work in the commercial world. It's also appropriate in the charity world as well. Um, and that's why we've got Matt with us to join us today. He's been sat there very quietly for just over half an hour, which is the first I think I've ever known of Matt. So here's Matt to explain how Mind have approached vulnerability. Hey, um, uh, just double checking. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Um, so hi, I'm uh, Matt Radford. So I'm the uh, retention and uh, experience manager at Mind, the mental health charity. Um, this quick case study is probably going to last about 10 minutes. Um, there's only a few slides on here. Um, but for me, I was one of the key stakeholders uh, at Mind in helping them uh, develop their uh, vulnerability work um, over the past kind of couple of years. Um, and I've decided to pull out some of the key bits that I think would be useful for the people that we've got on this this webinar. Um, I mean, we could literally go on about this for hours and hours and hours. And I just thought, you know, I'll just pick out a few things that I think would be the, the best takeaways for you guys um, that you'll be able to see that we've been doing and hopefully will help you as well. So I'm just going to start running through that now. Um, in terms of my history, I'm just throwing it out there. I've worked in the charity sector for about 15 years. Um, and I've specialized now in vulnerability um, and vulnerable groups management. Um, and I've worked with Elaine and Jackie for a number of years and I, uh, they're great to work with, um, which is awesome. But I will start now. Let's see if that works. And there we go. So yeah, I've broken this down into three sections, uh, which I have referred to as protecting, um, empower and colleagues. Um, First section being like, who are we helping effectively? The second section being actually, vulnerability isn't just about protecting people, it's about actually respect and empowering everyone. Um, so that there's that's a different cut side of the coin to where vulnerability is sometimes viewed. And the third is actually going, you know what, vulnerability, we're all humans um, and we need to make sure that we look at ourselves as well as our customers, supporters, and making sure that we take a holistic approach to this. Um, again, it, a lot of this is just down to respect um, and, and ethics. So, here we go. A few seconds. And we go back. Sorry, there's a bit of a lag, so I'm double clicking forwards too far. Right, there we go. So, first section protecting. 
So um, people need help, maybe from you, maybe from somewhere else. That's a strap line I've got at the top. That'll make sense in a moment. So for Mind and the work we've done on vulnerability, um, one of the questions that we asked ourselves, um, which you're probably going to ask yourselves if you're working on this, if you haven't already, is who is vulnerable and what does that mean? Um, there's a lot of different types of vulnerability in terms of how that sits in legislation. So for us, one of the key terms around vulnerability is in the fundraising regulation. So that specifically in the regulations we have around fundraising, there is mention of vulnerability. Um, but how that is treated and, for instance, how someone might, um, so for instance, COVID and people who are clinically vulnerable, clinically vulnerable, clinical vulnerability is a different term used in a different way. So one of the first things I'm, I'm saying here is vulnerability is very broad, but every time you hear the word vulnerability, it's important to be clear about what, where that's coming from and how it's being used. So that was one of the very first things that I thought would be potentially useful for some of the people on this call to go, actually, that's, that's a really good question to ask yourself is going vulnerability, yes, but actually, where is this coming from? Is it coming from legislation? Is it coming from our regulation, law? Is it coming from best practice? Um, or is it coming from our mission? So for mind and our mission focus, um, uh, working with vulnerable groups is in, and supporting them is like inherent to our mission. So ignoring all the regulations and everything, it's, it's just absolutely core cool to our work. Um, so that's where we're coming at that from, from a really, really top level. Um, so uh, for our project um, and our vulnerable groups project, uh, one of the first um, things that was very important to make clear was uh, the distinction between safeguarding and vulnerability. So um, this is often conflated when organizations look at vulnerability um, and treating uh, supporters fairly or customers fairly um, is actually they're treated as uh, either the same thing or you know related to each other. I'm not gonna go into the differences now, but um, the things I would say to you is if you're driving these projects forward, it's really important to have a good relationship between um, your uh, either safeguarding teams or um, how your organization views safeguarding and uh, have that relationship with how it then starts looking at and viewing vulnerability and treating supporters or consumers fairly. So I'm not going to go into the differences between those two, but they are different. And if you're driving these projects forward, super useful to get that out in the open at the start because it's going to do you massive favors mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. Um, second bit is thinking audience first. Um, I mean, this is, is absolutely crucial. Um, but there are things that you will and there are things that you won't know about your, your customers. So I found it particularly interesting, actually, when um, people said at the start um, that they always, uh, always treat vulnerable uh, consumers or customers um, with, um, I can't remember what the exact phrasing was, but the, the point being, you're not always going to know that you're dealing with someone who's in a vulnerable circumstance um, and you're just not going to um, because some person might not disclose the information they might be in that vulnerable situation but they might not disclose the information that lets you know that um, mm. and equally you might not expect them to have to disclose that information to you either mm -hmm. um, so it's important to actually accept that at an early stage for your organization to know where you're where your um, limits lie and going, actually, are we aiming to know everything about everyone? Probably not. Um, and, but it's, we still wanna have that support in there for people when they need it. Um, so that's something that we went through and going, actually, what do we know about our supporters and who we work with? What don't we know? And then treating that as a really good basis to move the project forwards. Beyond that, we also looked at our internal specialists. So you're going to have internal specialists, talk to them find out what they already know about this. Um, they can be a massive asset to your projects moving forward. Um, look at your data, look at your events, look at your incident logs, look at actually all the stuff that you're already dealing with. Um, you might see some trends there, you might see some commonalities. Um, again, from, from a project perspective, that was really useful for us to actually just start to, to look at these in terms of volumes and severity of, of um, what's happening out in the world or with, with supporters. Um, we looked at the referral mechanisms we had internally. So where do we refer people to when there's extra support or escalation? Um, again, if you're looking at this for yourselves, 
um, it's important to know that um, before you even get started on the project, you may have those mechanisms already in place. Um, and the last one there would be flagging. So actually, do you just already start flagging supporters for various reasons which are related to vulnerability? I'm not going to go into data or flagging on this case, but it's important for you to really just benchmark where you're at when you're going through all of this. Um, last section on the protect page, awareness. So going back to my previous point, um, which was actually, do you know everything about everyone? Um, we try, try to build our offer of support in as standard throughout most of the work we do. Um, so that, you know, we're not, someone's not having to tell us something always before we're offering the support that we inherently provide um, to our supporters. Um, so that's just something that we build in as standard and that's not dependent on what someone said to us. It's just going actually as standard, you know, if you want to come to us for mental health support, this is where you go. This is the way you can do it. Um, so it's just baked in. Um, support is just baked in from the get-go. Right, and empowering. So this section is slightly shorter. Um, at Mind, we had a pretty good uh, standard for how we, we work with supporters, but the first section on this page is assumptions. So one of the things that generally when working with vulnerable groups will focus on is, is actually just, instead of assuming, just asking how we can help people. Um, it's just just asking them, just saying, actually, how can I help? Um, really basic, and actually, Mind had that as a, as as kind of baked into its culture anyway, in terms of how we we support people. Um, but as part of this project, it it became explicit within um, the actual processes and the policies and the training that we had as an organisation to go actually just ask people, um, and that was really good. And one of the reasons why that was really good. Um, is asking helps empower people, which is great, but also it for onboarding, it's really great as well for new staff that you're getting that in at the start. Um, support, and I'm gonna run through these bits a lot faster so we can get this closed off. Um, so we've got time for questions, but support, you probably know that your organization support people um, in different ways. Important to know actually how you do that so that when something comes up, you know if you've got an offer of support available. Um, again, for Mind, it's quite a complex organisation, so actually getting down on paper how we supported people, it became very obvious it was very complex, but it was good to run through that exercise. Um, and also, also running through cases, so actually do's and don'ts, what you can and can't do, and running through that before something happens, and that again, a really good exercise for us part of this project. And by the way, these slides are going to get shut up afterwards, so you don't need to worry about knowing all of this stuff. Um, colleagues, very last section. Um, we undertook dedicated training. So um, I've done training uh, with Elaine and Jackie, but also my colleague, um, Louise, she's also done the training, which is dedicated training for vulnerable groups. Now, following that, um, we use that knowledge to actually help uh, refine our policies and processes, um, develop our own internal training and benchmarking that for all staff um and generally just the reviewing what we did but that was looking specifically not at safeguarding and not at specific mental health training that was vulnerability and like, it's really important to pull that out as something separate from than the other two um but that was our approach and going actually do you know what we we need to do this how do we do this okay we'll get these people with these specialisms and then we'll look at what we're doing internally based following that and then seeing how we embed that within our organization um the things we also have in place are things like wellness action plans we already have a workplace well-being department within mind so again a lot of this support stuff was baked in with mind as standard um which was great but those things you can look at separately after this not going to go into those as well as your eap offerings when you're going through this my final point i would say is look after staff as they're going through this if you have staff that are looking at vulnerable groups management, they are likely to be exposed to um, information and circumstances which could be triggering, could be extreme, whatever else it could be. But those staff themselves, it's really important that you're not just exposing them and looking at them as they go through this process without them having the support available to themselves mm -hmm. to look after themselves while they go through this process. And that's where it all ties back in that, yes, you're looking at your customers and supporters, but 
it's equally important to go, do you know what, these are staff, we have to look after them whilst they're going through this and looking at this. Um, so yeah, whistle stop tour, but those are the things I thought you would find most um, valuable. And I'm going to pass back over to Elaine and Jackie now. Thanks, Matt. That was that was really helpful, I think, to see from inside an organisation how you've approached it and taken, you know, the things that you and Louise picked up from our sessions and then have taken that back to your organisation and applied them. And and we still work together and answer questions and, and do things as we go along because we're all still developing our knowledge. You know, as I say, Jackie and I have been doing this for sort of 10 years or more now, and there are still things that surprise us that come up um, even now. But I think sort of to, to sort of try and close the loop on where we started in this, in order to make sure that we're treating vulnerable customers fairly, we have to be able to track the outcomes of them um, versus non-vulnerable -custom customers. And the FCA's requirement is that they have to be treated at least as well, um, which means that you have to track both sets of data. And what we have to remember is that, as we said before, some customers are vulnerable some of the time, not always, and in every interaction. So we have to think about how we label or tag those records. It's, it can't be at customer level because today, if I've been bereaved, or perhaps I was bereaved in March, I might have been vulnerable when I had that conversation, but in October, November, December, maybe I'm absolutely fine and I'm no longer vulnerable. So a vulnerability flag on my record as a customer would then be inappropriate to have. So we, we need to keep that data um, timely and relevant and in compliance with the ICO's codes. Um, and having tagged and tracked the data, and that, that often involves compliance teams thinking through what their policies and procedures are for maintaining the accuracy and relevancy of that data. Um, but we have to report on the outcomes. Um, and we have to compare and contrast, you know, have this set of customers had the same outcomes and treatment as those set of customers, or is it better or worse? And then we have to be able to adjust. So there, it's something that we can't just do as a one-off exercise, right? Yeah, we, we tick that box and we're all fair but next month we'll forget about it and move on. So it has to be an ongoing thing. And one of the things that we found is actually giving that as to board level responsibility so that it's reported to the board is a really helpful thing because that's where your culture is driven from. And as you say, Matt, lots of those things that you talk about are baked into your organization's culture. They are in, you know, part of your founding principles. They are your um, your cornerstones from which you work and build. And so you as an organisation at Mind have, have had those things. For others, it's perhaps not been the same because they're not focusing on mental health in quite the same way you are. Um, but it's, it's really important. And our strong recommendation that is board level responsibility will ensure that things are being monitored, that they are being understood and assessed and that change, if it's needed, can be driven from the top because we can't leave it to contact centre teams to be constantly pushing things upwards. It has to come from from all actually from all directions. Contact centre staff should be encouraged to raise questions, issues, and, and challenges that they're facing, and the board have a responsibility to address those and for their customers. Otherwise, you will lose brand loyalty, you will lose brand advocacy from your customers, you will see high customer churn, and you'll see high um, staff churn too, because your teams just will get frustrated. Um, so if there are discrepancies, you have to address them, I think. Thanks, Thanks Liz. Um, thank you, Matt. It was really, um, really good to hear um, your comments there. Um, so really, I'm, I'm going to summarise up. We're coming towards the end of the webinar now, and we would like, obviously, some time for, for questions. But just as a, a, a brief summary, um, we've shared with you today some examples that we've uh, experienced um, over our 10 years of working together. Um, and whilst there are common themes um, that training, uh, we find that there are there are obviously a lot of unfair outcomes. There's an imbalance sometimes in customer service and vulnerable circumstances. But what I think the one of the clear messages here is your business is your business, it's bespoke to you. You will have to make those changes. You'll have to think about your organization, as Elena said. But, you know, just some pointers here. Start by knowing your customers, understand the scale of vulnerability in your organization and the nature of vulnerability and the drivers of it in your customer base. So what, what, what are you understanding? What do you know from the intelligence that you've got and how can you use that? Um, consider how that will affect their needs and what reasonable adjustments are required, but what reasonable adjustments can you actually make? So some organizations, as we've said, might be well advanced with this, 
others may have to make this in phases and start um, stages. You may be able to do some things now, other things may be for future development. Thinking about data and information and management, capture it, record it, use it, signposting. We've not talked really a lot about that, but signposting is critical both mm -hmm. internal for your organisation, but external for your customers as well. And as we've spoke about many times over this last hour, train your staff to recognise the vulnerabilities, train them to recognise vulnerability, but also what reasonable adjustments can they make to help that customer? And are they at ease with vulnerability? Is it something that as part as what Elaine and both Matt have said, it comes from the culture of your, of your business that they uh, understand it, they're familiar with it, they're not phased with it. And get your culture right, customer centric, senior leaders, leadership management team, all driving this, you will get much better results. And as we've talked about very briefly, use technology to support absolutely some great technology out there to help organisations uh, with um, customers in vulnerable circumstances. But talking to a human being is usually what most people want to do. And keep your staff empowered because that will create those reasonable adjustments and it will also deliver results for you. Hope that was helpful for you. Hope you um, uh, enjoyed what we've um, had to share with you today. Um, so now we will open for any questions that anyone may have. That was brilliant, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you, Elaine. So uh, as Jackie's just said, if you've got any questions, please post them into the questions box and I'll put them to our presenters now. If you do have any questions that you think of maybe after the session, um, I'm going to be sending out a follow up email within the next 24 hours and my presenters have given me permission to give you their contact details so that you can contact them directly. Um, so be, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, with the follow up email will also be a link to the replay play so if you feel that anybody else within your organization would benefit from the content please feel free to share um, that video as well so just onto the questions uh, the first one from the audience that we have uh, it says are all vulnerabilities relevant to the way a firm works or in other words are there are there any customer vulnerabilities that a firm doesn't have a responsibility to act upon Oh, <laughs> good question. <laughs> Matt, do you want to have that? Oh, that Oscar Oscar? Yeah, I, I thought I'd just go. I thought I'd just go for this. Um, so it's really important to understand what your business does. Um, a lot of it, when we're talking about it, I mean, a really basic example is sometimes this is just about asking. So, it's like, what is your organisation asking? What are they doing? Um, mm. And and that's going to vary massively, but it's really important to really be comfortable with what it is you're doing. Because if you you aren't, you're not going to know how where where that interplay is. And when it comes back down to this, I, I'd probably say one of the important things is asking the right questions. Because mm. if you're asking the right questions, at some point. A vulnerability that you went you previously discounted might start to be mm. um, important later if yeah. you're asking the right questions mm. and if you're not asking the right questions and you've just ruled that out as something to consider there is a chance that later on you're 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 falling foul of what you would intend or your or your intentions are for what you're hoping to do with your customers or supporters so so i would really kind of encourage this kind of ongoing ongoing learning and ongoing development piece but the absolute core is just being comfortable with what it is you're doing because if you're not comfortable with what it is you're doing you're not going to really be able to fully understand how that impacts on people that that's my kind of take on it I yeah think i'd add to that matt i think you um that you're absolutely right you need to understand what you're doing and who are you working with um and in a particular interaction it may not seem like it's a relevance uh, or the, in that in, in, um, interaction itself, but actually very few of us are having relationships with customer where we're once and done and we interact with them once and then we never talk to them again. Most of the organisations, and I'm sure all of you in, the, in, in this uh, webinar, are trying to build relationships with your customers because you want to interact with them on an ongoing basis. So whilst it might not be relevant in this immediate 
instance, it could become relevant in that life cycle of that customer relationship you have with them. So I think it's important to recognize, as Matt says, what do you do? What are your, because you're not just having one-off interactions with customers, you're having long, hopefully long lifetime relationships with them. So as you, as you say, Matt, it might not seem relevant now, or but it, but it, um, it could well become important further down the line. And totally yeah. relevant. Yeah. The customer may say to you, but I told you that several months ago. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, so then on to the next question. Why would you train all of your staff within your organisation on vulnerability? Jackie, do you want to go? Um, well, I, I think I think as we've said, it's about it's about recognizing vulnerability and where that sits in your organization, but also leading from from senior leaders and managers. So I, I believe that training everyone brings that culture into place, if I'm honest, and that um, ability for all, in particular agents, to feel comfortable talking about vulnerability, understanding it more and recognizing it. So I, I truly believe that by training everyone, you get everyone on board in the sense of that they understand and they understand what their part is within the organization, that where they can contribute um, and where they can add that value, but also recognize those adjustments and make those reasonable adjustments for everyone. And for me, I think sometimes we, we, we're, we're guilty of working in silos and I think about back office staff and why do our finance or invoicing teams need to worry about customers in vulnerable circumstances. The, the thing is that it can drive policy that isn't appropriate or doesn't actually create a fair outcome for a customer because those staff who are creating those policies haven't necessarily been involved in the, in the conversations, don't necessarily see the immediate impact. Whereas if you can involve all of your teams, it really does help drive proper policy that has due consideration. And it, you know, in a, in a, with my marketing hat on, when we're working with customer experience staff, we have we use customer personas, and it's almost it's like rare as hen's teeth when you find a, an organisation that's got a customer persona that has a, a vulnerability built into it. And I think if we start stress testing our customer journeys. It, with its inherent that we are going to meet customers in vulnerable circumstances and with those FCA stats, 57, uh, sorry, 53%, 27.7 million people, it's not needles in haystack. This is all, this is every other, potentially every other conversation we're having. So actually, once we get our collective heads round, we are dealing with customers in vulnerable circumstances and we have to be able to address their needs. It helps people in back office and non-customer facing roles to understand it so that actually they can help provide information and input into the solutions too. Because actually, some of them may be living with vulnerable circumstances themselves yeah. and can share that lived experience, which can really help drive change. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I was going to add to that really quick with the blue text font example that you would do, so where you're printing stuff out with blue copy, it's like what, mm -hmm. in terms of front-facing teams, you do that for a customer, but you won't do it for your internal staff? That is just, just weird, yeah. just fundamentally <laughs> yeah. weird, um, which yeah. is why that's like broad spectrum. It's like, well, yeah, that would probably be helpful if everyone looked at stuff that way. Good point. Back to that lived experience. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm just going to squeeze one last question in. Um, okay. How do organisations usually fund training? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting one. I think in a variety of ways, to be honest. Um, so, so, I mean, from us, it's it's very much um, organisations look at their training. It might be a training budget. There may be where we train trainers, we train individuals to train in organisations and, and, and uh, do that. But I think it comes from a wide range of areas. I don't know whether you've got any comments on that, Elaine, of the areas that you might have seen. Certainly, there's a training budget usually. Yeah, there's, there's usually a training budget um, and there are lots of resources out there. Jackie and I are trainers, but there are other folk out there. Yeah. Um, definitely, we know that. Um, but it's it's around recognising that there's a need within the business, to, to a problem that needs to be tackled or solved, or actually there's a building a case for, actually we want to improve our service, we want to reduce our complaints, and this is a particular issue that's driving those complaints so building the business case and that enables you to then say right okay what resource are we going to commit to this as a business um 
And once you've secured that business case, it's then much easier to find the funding um, and to convince leaders in this, you know, the SLT that actually there is a real need to address it and not necessarily cobble it together from a few slides that you, sorry, but picked up from a webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, it's basically the same thing. I don't. Uh, so even looking from my history, like international development and security, it's like, well, if you're going to do something, are you going to do like security adjustments, like where it, or security training or whatever it might be? It's like, okay, you want us to do this. If you want us to do that, where is the budget for it? Where's the budget line? Mm -hmm. Where is this being driven from organisationally? Because if it's an organisational priority to work on this, mm -hmm. it's going to very likely have a budget line against it. Yeah. Um, or if you want me to do that or work on it, okay, but what what resources have I got to deliver it? Mm -hmm. and, or and, and if you if you haven't got resources, what sacrifices are you doing in other work to yeah. make that that happen? Um you know, because work doesn't happen for free effectively. Um that I mean that's where I'd probably say is it's just the infrastructure. It's like where does that come from and being honest about it? And also understanding what resources do you have available within the team and experience and knowledge. You know, you can send somebody off to go and research around vulnerability and it will take them three years or you could shortcut the process and bring in some external support that might speed up that process and be an initial investment that the organisation can then take forward. So there are lots of different ways to tackle the issue, but you're absolutely right. If there's a need, it needs, you know, we need a budget line associated with it. Otherwise, the business isn't really committed to addressing that. And actually, you know, going back to what we've said earlier, if it improves brand advocacy, improves loyalty, reduces complaints, it's almost self-financing. I know you've got to find cash to do it, but there's a there's an end result that gives you excellent results if you get it right. That's great. Thank you. I know we've uh, overrun by just a couple of minutes, so I'm going to close off today. Um, so that concludes today's session. I would just like to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. I hope you all found the information uh, very informative and thought provoking. A very special thank you to my special guests today, Elaine, Jackie and Matt, for delivering today's session. If you do have any further questions for our presenters, like I said, contact details will be included in the follow up email that's coming out to you all. Um, with the playback play back link to the recording. Uh, for more information on membership of the UK Contact Centre Forum and for, the, for a full list of all upcoming UK CCF webinars, please you visit our website, www.uk-ccf.co.uk. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you all again soon. Thank you very much. Stay safe, enjoy the sunshine, and goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.